Hello, hello, and welcome to The Big Show. This is it, The Big Show, the hobnobbing with Slim Man podcast, and I am your host, Slim Man, Slim Papa Showstopper, coming to you from an undisclosed location in sunny Southern California. I'm in Mark Antoine's studio. We just finished the Rat Pack Tracks CD. Wow, CD sounds great. I was going to call it Rat Pack Tracks, but a few nights ago, after a little... Vino with the Dino, Mark suggested the title Young at Heart. A light bulb went on right above my oversized donkey head, and I knew that's what we should call it. So, Young at Heart it is. I got to change all the artwork and stuff, but the hell with it. You got to do whatever you can do to make it the best it's going to be. Right, Slim People? So, we're calling the CD Young at Heart. We've done 12 songs, um... The best is yet to come, nice and easy, the way you look tonight. Come fly with me, young at heart, which is what we in the biz call the title track. Summer wind, all of me, I've got the world in a string. You make me feel so young, the very thought of you, witchcraft and L-O-V-E love, the old Nat King Cole tune. We mixed uh, 12 songs in five days. We worked all day in the studio and I cooked every night. Check out the dishes I made. Shrimp scampi, poached salmon with a homemade mustard aioli, which turned out so great. I made chicken piccata. One night I made rockfish with panko and rosemary breadcrumbs. Another night I made chicken thighs with shallots and wine, put them under the broiler with some parmigiano reggiano cheese, and oh, she was a so nice. Last night I made a bolognese sauce with my extraordinary hail Caesar salad with the homemade croutons. So every day we'd put on the headphones. Every night we'd strap on a feed bag. It was not a so bad. So let's have a listen to my chat with my good friend Robert Ellis Arl. I moved from Baltimore to Nashville in 2011, right around there. And uh, one of the first friends I made there was a guy named Robert Ellis Arl, R E O. I knew that he had co written and co produced some of the songs on the first few Taylor Swift CDs, but not much else. We used to play tennis a couple times a week. I'd ride my bike over to the beat-up tennis courts by the local middle school, and we'd play for an hour or so. We became good friends. Robert is a fascinating, multifaceted guy. He's an artist who creates paintings that are really unique and funny. He also has a punk pop label called Infinity Cat. And his two sons have a band called Jeff the Brotherhood, which is one of my favorites. And Robert is a really amazing songwriter who's written tons of number ones. The chat took place at the new Infinity Cat headquarters, which is in a small house in Nashville. We did the interview in the shed out back, which Robert was turning into a small studio. He was unpacking a lot of his vinyl albums as we were chatting. It was hot, so we turned on the AC, but the problem was it was a window unit. And if you hear a hum in the background, that's where it's a coming from. So here is my chat with Robert Ellis Arroll. You're a painter, and you're a songwriter. Your daughter's a painter, painter and your two kids are songwriter Songwriters. artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're both it, really good visual artists, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. The boys, yeah. So, how did, I mean, how did how did you get started? Was your was your dad, was it your mom, a, a, any creative type of thing? N- neither. Uh, my, da- my, <laughs> my dad plays the harmonica. He uh, plays about four songs. That's it. <laughs> and my mom always wanted to be, a singer, you know, like an actress on Broadway, but she was missing one of the requirements, which was talent. Um, she, but she did have the, the, the enthusiasm. So she was in like local theater and that kind of thing. I just, um, I, I grew up listening to, because of my mom, she listened to a lot of Broadway soundtracks. You know, uh, she'd listen to the guys and dolls or my how to succeed lady, in business. Right. Yeah, all stuff. And I love that. Story. I, I love that stuff because I could visualize. You know the, the, what was going on, and then my grandfather, when I was nine, gave me this 
beautiful puppet stage, huge puppet stage. I still have it uh, with hand puppets, but it had a rheostat lights that came up from, you know, it had cur working curtains, had a stage, had a, you could change the scenery and fly. So I would literally put on like Camelot with two hands. You know what I mean? <laughs> and who were you doing this for? Just yourself or your well, brothers and sisters? Well, pretty, pretty much, except I lo what I loved is the process. I loved making, s I didn't know what, it, what you would call it at the time, the process, but I just loved spending months making scenery and making uh, making puppets and doing all stuff. And then it would all pay off for that big day when I'd have the show and you get like eight neighbor kids coming and make some popcorn and do the show and that's over. That's it. That's so you were, another one. You were recreating shows that already existed. You weren't doing original shows, right? I mean, you weren't like right in the I, I did own. find, you know what? I, I've got the, the puppet stage is over in our garage on Martin Street right now and there's a little drawer in the back and where you keep spare lights and stuff. And I pulled that drawer open the other day and there was a script in there in my handwriting. And it's, original? An, it's an original screenplay, yeah. It's a re <laughs> and it's, it's really hilarious because it's, I mean... I, you're, you're nine years old. You know, it would be great would be to, uh, to type that back out and then start pitching it to... Hollywood. Yeah, Hollywood. I wrote this when I was nine. And, Ryan, and when you do that, when you do the pitch in front of all the executives, you got to have the the little marionettes and puppets and stuff, and your yeah. little stage. Like, you know, I got to bring this. I stuff definitely in. start. I definitely started early with the whole show business thing. So, like, you you start off with <laughs> with puppets, and then how do you get into the well, songwriting? Well, by the time I was, uh, my first band was in the third grade. I had a band called the JB Four. And I played the drums and I had a cool logo, the JB4 on, on the, uh, on the drum head. And, um, my, uh, I, I, there was one guy named Jeff, Jeffrey. That's, that's why it's kind of interesting because my ba kid's band's named Jeff, the Brotherhood. But anyway, my first band was with a guy named Jeff and he was really good musician. I mean, he went on to go to like Juilliard or something like that. He played the piano and he could sing. I could sing, play the drums, but like one of those toy drum sets, but it had a cool, like I say, it had a cool logo on the front, the JB4. We later changed the name. We never got two more people to be in the band. So we, we, we decided to change our name to the Incredibles. Yeah. Just two of you? Always just the two of in us. In the JB4. Yeah. In the JB4, yeah. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I started writing, I started writing songs when I was a little kid. Like 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 then. I mean, they were dumb, but you know, I didn't so, know that. <laughs> so that's kind of strange. Like you got the JB4, and you're only two guys, and your two sons, Jake and Jamin, have Jeff the Brotherhood, and it's only two guys. Yeah, I never thought about it till right now. I mean, that's really never occurred to me. I need to, I need to throw that out at them the next time I see them, and, and throw. Listen, check this out. I was talking to this guy the other day, Slim Manicotti, <laughs> and um, I mentioned this, and he was like, "Whoa." And so let's, uh, there you go. Now let's discuss. Let's discuss. <laughs> so you're writing songs, you're in third grade, then you're like going through the school thing. No, I had a band called the Two Plus Twos in the fifth grade. Uh, and that was pretty good, pretty good band. There was four of us in that one. Uh, it was the two, uh, like, most uncool kids in the school and the two coolest kids in the school. Now, the two most uncool kids were me and Doug Millett, but we could play and we could play like songs like Complicated, like Penny Lane or something. Right. Um, and then we got this kid, Steve Piero, to play the drums and he was a good drummer and had a place for us to rehearse in his basement. But the, the fourth member, we didn't, I mean, no one played bass in the fifth grade. So we got this kid named Gary Milo who was the number one coolest kid in the school. He was an absolute girl magnet. And uh, he didn't do anything in the band. He just stood, <laughs> he literally stood and just sort of, you know, sort of moved back and forth. He didn't, we didn't even think to give him a tambourine. It was a spokesmodel. We just had him there because the girls just like, oh my God, Gary. You know, we were doing the heavy lifting, but right. yeah. And then, so you, you go through school, like, when did you like start, you know what I mean? How, you know, you, you get out of high school, did you go to college? Well, I, I, it, when I was in high school, I had a duo with this same guy, Doug Millett, from the sixth grade. And then my dad, you know, insisted that I go to college to have something to fall back on. And I don't blame him. He didn't, what was he going to, music? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Um, I mean, he was in the printing business and, you know, a workaholic, worked, you know, 12 hours a day, came home. And then after dinner, he'd go down to his home office and estimate jobs. And I mean, he was just an incredible, incredible father and incredible work ethic. And... um he uh, didn't understand anything about creative. You know, creative, if you were sitting thinking up 
something creative, you're just, that's kind of equating being, that's like being lazy. Right. You know, we're just sitting around. Uh, so he said, you know, I want you to go to school. So we, I went to Susquehanna University in Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania. I was about to say Susquehanna River yeah. up there. I don't know why I went there, but uh, I didn't question a lot back then. So I went, and then I took, I was interested in philosophy, and I took these all kinds of philosophy courses, logic, that kind of stuff. And I played tennis a lot with my philosophy professors and uh, became friends with them, went to their houses for dinner, hung out, played a little music sometimes. And I came home uh, from winter break, and my dad said, So what do you, what do you, what do you, uh, what are you, his he Boston accent, he's like, Bobby, what are you doing? What, what, what are you doing at school? I'm doing philosophy, Dad. Philosophy? What are you going to do with philosophy? Are you going to open a philosophy shop? <laughs> he couldn't see the profit in it. And and I said, well, I don't want, I want to make music is what I want to do. So uh, I, the, he said, well, maybe you could find a way to go to college and make, anyway, so I went to Berkeley School of Music the next year. You for, did? Yeah, for about three months. Oh. And, uh, had a little falling out. I had philosophical differences with my uh, with a couple of the professors there. So I just uh, I walked out one day and I shouted some expletives and never went back. But now I'm an alumni. I get the alumni magazine and how come you're an alumni? Because they because you know most of the people that went on to be to do something in music uh, that made them slightly famous. Right left the school. Now, a lot of people graduated from the school and went on to do amazing things in other ways or, you know, maybe in a jazz band or they, they're teaching or whatever that, but so they, at some point, they, someone must have made a conscious decision to contact all the people that went someplace and I made, I think after I moved here and I made my fourth album for RCA, they, I got, I got a thing in the mail saying, you know, here's your alumni magazine. An honorary degree. Yeah, no, I would love an honorary degree. Well, that's cool. Uh, I just love one. I'd love one, but you know, I don't, they're not handing them out like candy. Yeah, I know. So, um, when did you start like, uh, you know, you, you, you got signed by RCA first, right? Right. That was in, uh, I made my, I made a record on my own. Um, called Sweet Nothing. And this is back before people made records hey, man, how, by themselves. How, how are you making a record on your own in 1979? It was 1977. I mean, I, I wanted to make a record and I wanted to get the record out to people at record labels. So I thought if I send them a, a cassette, you know, that's the, the mode of uh, recording back then, they're not going to pay any attention to it. But if I actually send them a, a record on vinyl, they're going to go, wow, this guy's already, uh, you know, on record. So we should sign him. That was my cockeyed thinking. So I went into Boston, found a studio, uh, knocked on the door, went in and said, I want to make a record. How, how do I do that? And they said, well, <laughs> uh, have you got a band? I said, well, I'll put one together. You got songs? Oh, I got songs. You know, I had, at this point, I was writing really pretty good songs. Uh, and uh, they, they, I said, how much is this going to cost? And we, we worked it all out. This guy, Alan Smith, who was the uh, engineer. And I put a band together by meeting a couple of guys, uh, well, got back with Doug Millett, my old guitar player in the duo. And then we found a bass player and a drummer at a bar in, in, uh, in Danvers or something. <laughs> I mean, the night before we went in the studio. And uh, we, we, we cut the songs over a period of a couple of days. And then I don't think I ever saw those guys again, except to maybe deliver a couple copies of the record. But I spent the rest of the you know week uh, you know, singing and doing harmonies and all that. And I learned, it was an amazing, it was an amazing crash course in, in, in how to make a record. And I sent that record out and I had an amazing crash course in rejection. I still have every one of those rejection letters and they're in a, a binder called Rejected, of course. <laughs> and I love to look at them and show them to people sometimes because a lot of those people that rejected me and said, you know, not hearing this or just a form letter or whatever, but some of them came from people I ended up working with in, right. you know, like 25 years later. Wow. Like Joe Galani at RCA. He sent me a, a nice record saying, uh, you, you know, no thank you. Well, who uh, said yes? Nobody. Nobody? Nobody. Oh. This was in 77. It wasn't until 81 where I had now put a real band together and started playing in clubs in Boston. And then uh, this guy from uh, England named Paul McNally, who had been given an imprint label called Wi-Fi at RCA in London, he came to Boston because he'd heard about me somehow and saw me and offered me a record deal. And that was that. Just like that. Yeah. 
And so you're on this British imprint. Right. British and then, imprint. And it came out in the United States, of course. The uh, first album, using my last name as a trick in the title, it was Robert Ellis Oral Fixation. Oral Fixation. Uh -huh. Got and, it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I st I, somewhere around my art shack here, I've got some lollipops from back then, seriously, that say, I've got an oral fixation. That was their promo gift that so they sent you, out. It was a band, but it was your name. It was a band, right. but it was my name. And which I always, you know, they say, uh, it's not really a regret, but I was a one-hit wonder in, it, in the top 40 with the song called uh, I Couldn't Say No, which was a duet with Carlene Carter, who is uh, June Carter Cash's daughter. Right. Uh, and... Uh, I went on to co-write her first country single, The Sweetest Thing, years and years later. Everything, these things just keep going around in circles. It's amazing. But um, at the time, I should have really named the band something because you don't, Tommy Two-Tone, right. and that's not a guy. I mean, that's the band, Tommy Two-Tone. But uh, you, don't, you don't forget that. It was a cool band name, and they had one hit too. Of course, it was much bigger. Eight six seven five three zero oh, nine. So after you, how many albums did you do for RCA? Well, I made three. Uh, I made my uh, first record in Boston, and then I toured, you know, the United States, and then I started going over to England. And um, I made the next two records in Wales at a very famous studio called Rockfield Studio, and, and that 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 came about because uh, if you see behind me. Hey, I, these are my records, and they're my records final, final from records. Va from yeah. back then. And one of my favorite artists was Elvis Costello, and everything over there in plastic is all just Elvis Costello. A weird, like I have the best Elvis Costello collection you've ever seen, and Nick Lowe and and Rock Pile with Dave Edmonds. So those were all your those were my songwriting heroes. heroes. Yeah, and I look on the back of the record, and I see uh, you know produced by Nick Lowe, uh, engineered by Roger Basharian. I felt like, ah, I probably don't have a shot at getting Nick Lowe. I don't know why I thought that, but looking back, but I, Roger Basharian, I know that he was, like, the album Trust, which was amazing. Like, he was responsible for that glittery, beautiful sound, but still tough enough to be, you know, Elvis back in those days. And uh, so I said to my record label, I want to use this guy, Roger Basharian, and they just said, all right. It's just... Yeah, yeah okay. they went, all right. And I was like... Oh, but I ended up on, on that on that first record. I ended up uh, I ended up recording the duet with Carlene, who was Nick Lowe's wife, and who I had met because I'd opened for her twice in Boston, and I just thought she was the coolest. I have all her records sitting behind me too, uh, Carlene Carter, and I wrote the song for us, and then ended up getting to sing it with her in Nick Lowe's basement studio in London. And yeah, so yeah. It, it was amazing the way things like you, 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 what you do is you have to ask. Yeah, yeah I'm not the, good at asking still today. Yeah, me neither. But when you ask, things happen. It's strange, isn't it? You hook up with this uh, with this engineer guy, and he does the album in, Roger, in, in Wales. Right, right. We're so we're in Wales, and uh, we go over there. We make this first record, Fixation. And uh, it was a dream come true, of course. And, and it, that's where Rockpile, the band Nick Lowe, yeah, that's where that's where they that's where they made their records. You know, Queen recorded there. I mean, it was like what? It's just, it, it was a it was a, a, a residential studio out. You know, they turned a farm into a studio. So you had sheep and you had stables and horses, and it's all surrounded by old castles and the little town. I mean, I remember one day. Uh, a little town called Monmouth, and I would go down and get my uh, bangers, little uh, little sausages and and toast and some hot mustard, and every morning I'd make buttered toast with bangers on it, and I had this little kitchen of my own, and, and one day I came in, and it was, had a little restaurant booth in it, and sitting in my restaurant booth drinking tea was Robert Plant, and I was like, oh, hey, hi. He's like, oh, you don't mind, do you? And I, no, no, not at all. And I, he said, sit down, sit down. And... Uh, I was like, what are you doing here? He says, oh, you know, I forget it because I was like starstruck. So I forget the story exactly, but he'd been thrown out of his castle by his girlfriend or something. And all of his clothes were in road 
road containers in one of the stables. Anvil cases. Yeah, anvil big anvil cases full of clothes. I saw him fishing all through. <laughs> had Led Zeppelin written on them and stenciled. <laughs> It's, what's funny is I went back to make work on the next record the next year, and he showed up again, and we and I challenged him to a ping pong match, and uh, un, uh, unfortunately I, I can't say I beat him in ping pong because it went like three hits, and then he was like, oh, I've got to get going, you know. So that's wild. Yeah, I, I was in a, I was at Patrick's Patrick Clifford's house in uh, Green Hills. Yeah, and I, I went into the buy right that funky get <laughs> right. grocery store. And a I'm, cool grocery yeah, store, very really. Cool. But yeah. It is very cool. Yeah. I, I went there all Love the time. I you know, Mary knew all the people right. that worked there. And I'm in line, right behind me is Robert Plant. Right. You know, so I'm like, I, and I, I left and I, I walked, went to walk out and I walked back. I said, look, I, I just got to say hello. I saw you when you opened up for the Who in 1969 at Meriwether Post Pavilion in Baltimore, Maryland. He goes, yeah, I never wanted to do that show. I'm like, why not? He goes, I always thought we were so much better than the Who. I said, <laughs> All right. I, said, I love that. I, I said, I thought you were too, but I'm glad you did because, I mean, your show just changed my life. I mean, what a great band they were. Wow. So did... Wow, that's great. It's, it's funny that I because I'm talking about meeting Robert in Wales, but then, you know, yeah, I've seen him down at City House, you know, at the bar. Yeah, yeah. it's strange. What, what, does he live here or is he just he, recording? He, no, he's, he, he lives here. He's got a house here for sure, yeah. He does? Yeah. Because I still, we're, what's that, is it, it's not Sun Studios. What's that studio right next yeah, to Bunright? Yeah, Sun, Sun Bar Studios is right next to Bunright, yeah. But what's the one in... In, in between, in, oh, the, no, uh, no, no, oh, no. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I've recorded there a few times. It's changed owners, but Sound yeah. Emporium. Yeah, and that's it. what's... Isn't there a Sun Studio in Memphis? The, yes, there is. The famous one. The famous one yeah. where Elvis recorded. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you do your... How many albums did you do with this engineer guy? I did uh, two with Roger. Um, the second one was just... The uh, second one was uh, called... Sp ugh. Special effects. Special paint. Now, was that special paint? I think it was. <laughs> I no. got to look it up on Wikipedia. No, I'm actually lo looking at my records. <laughs> oh, they're over here. Uh... See here. Here's all right. So the second one was that's it, special pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the one that had the uh you know, the sort of hit, the sort of hit. Uh you know, I got to listen to Casey Kasem every week and doing the the countdown. And um here's this. Look at this. This is look at that, look at that. It's like uh the Israeli version of it or something. I've got I've got, Arab import. It's crazy. I've got you know it, I don't know why I keep all this, but you know what am I going to do? I can't toss it, right? You know what? Here, here now I'm looking here. Look at this. This is look what this is. This is uh, back when when you had a radio special or whatever. These companies they had to do it on vinyl, and this is look at that King Biscuit Flower Hour. I remember that. Yeah, it was like my favorite show on the radio. Yeah, King Biscuit Flower, and that's and then I got to do that. So how many out? You you did three albums for three albums for RCA, um, and uh, then they wisened up and dropped me. But uh, a few years later, uh, after I moved to Nashville because I could see that it was a great place for songwriters, uh, and I'd started learning about country music. I had never really listened to it before. So then, this yeah. is all like kind of what like uh, like Elvis Costello. It's like Jack, kind of? Joe Jackson, Elvis Costello, Nick Lowe. Right. Those are my gotcha. those are my heroes. Yeah. You get dropped from RCA. Was that a heartbreaker? It was a heart. It wasn't as heartbreaking as you would think because my manager at the time asked for me to be released. Oh, so I kind of thought, well, he knows what he's doing. Um, he didn't like the way they were handling things. It turns out he had another act in the label that he was really upset about. So I think what he did was says, I'm pulling my axe from the label. And then he said to me, don't worry, I know, you know, Jack so-and-so over at Chrysalis, get your deal over there. I went over there and, uh, you know, he played the stuff and he took me around a few places. But, you know, no, don't worry about it. Chrysalis is going to be it. But uh, they said that I was too close to... Uh, someone they had on the label that was doing very well named Huey Lewis. So uh, <laughs> so then I was like, well, where do we go next? And he's like, oh, well, um, gee, I, and that was the end of that. So I found so, myself, I went back to, I, I was back to doing, um, you know, I had, I had a family starting. So I had to pay 
the bills and I started painting people's houses. Oh, you're doing not the painting, but paintings. Right. You're painting painting houses. people's houses. Or you're like doing drawing figures and like, you know. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'll tell you what figures. I was doing. I love painting rooms. Um, last year I painted my son Jake's uh, whole house. I whitewashed the whole thing because, you know, he, he was had you're a like, good idea. You're like Tom Sawyer. No, I just love to paint. And, <laughs> and uh, I get it. When you're painting, you, your mind has all this room to go places. It's like almost like the art of like almost doing kind of nothing. Like, right. you know what I mean? You, right. It's so like, you know, like. Right. You're rolling that, out that paint, thing. rolling yeah, up, right. cutting in, cutting right. in. So songs, I, I wrote lots of songs on the job, you know, just singing them. I, I got songs cut that I wrote while I was painting someone's house in Marblehead, you know. And now for a word from our sponsors. Are you looking to buy or sell a home in the Palm Springs area? Well, may I suggest you reach out to Cindy Gouzet. She's with Berkshire Hathaway. That's a good company. She's been living out here for the past 20 years or so. Palm Springs is a nicer place. It's also a really big place, especially when you take into consideration all the surrounding towns. Desert Hot Springs, Palm Desert, Rancho Mirage, Indian Wells. You need somebody who knows the area. You need somebody with experience. You need Cindy Guze. She raised her kids here. She knows the schools, the hospitals. She's a dog lover, so she knows all about vets and pet care. Give her a call, 760-485-2505, or send her an email at cindy.guze at outlook.com. That's 760-485-2505, or cindy.guze at outlook.com. Guze is G. U-S-E. Another one of our sponsors here at Hobnob and with Slim Man is the Foundation for International Aid to Animals, helping animals by helping people care for them. The FIAA was founded by my cousin, Mindy Kamboneski, who's an artist, and uh, she was deeply troubled by the number of homeless dogs on the streets when she visited Chile, South America. Chile is a beautiful place. I mean, the coast looks a lot like uh, Monterey, California. And I went there a couple of years ago, and the sheer number of homeless dogs, I mean, it really it really made me sad. I got to tell you, it really bothered me. And it bothered Mindy enough that she started the FIAA to solve the problem. The foundation is a nonprofit family foundation based in the U.S., the FIAA has pioneered sterilization and treatment programs for homeless and sheltered dogs, and it also helps people with limited resources treat and care for their pets. Check out their website, aid2animals.org. You can find out about all the great work they're doing for abused and neglected animals all around the world. And if you get inspired, there's a donate button. That's aid2animals.org. And now let me tell you about Uline, one of my favorite businesses to deal with. I've been using Uline for years. Whenever I need shipping supplies for my CDs and cookbooks, I call Uline, U-L-I-N-E. You know what I love about them? You dial them up and a human being answers the phone. A real live human being. Imagine that. They have your complete ordering history right in front of them and you tell them what you want and they ship it right away. I don't know if they have computerized sheds with robots located strategically all over the United States. They always seem to manage to get my orders to me the next day without the big fees. Check out their website, uline.com, U-L-I-N-E.com, or give them a call at 800-295-5510. I use them all the time, slim people, good folks to do biz with. What year was it that you moved to Nashville? 1990. Um, I'd gotten a couple cuts in Nashville by learning how they did it down here. And um, and then the week that I moved here, uh, it's kind of just kismet. It, it, uh, it was the same week as my first number one song. And I drove down ahead of uh, my two boys. My daughter hadn't been 
born, conceived yet, actually, um, and my wife. I drove down ahead of them, and I, I secured the house that we were buying, and I, uh, I went to pick them up at the airport, and I drove them from there. We stopped at Wendy's to clean their chocolate faces, but we drove from there to a number one party for Next to You, Next to Me. The television cameras, who the did, band was there. Who Everyone, did the song? It, it, who, who? Uh, Shenandoah. Oh, yeah. It was a huge hit for them. I, it's still... It's still Pay some of the bills. I mean, it's a, it's been recorded like six or seven times. Most recently, uh, uh, by Rascal Flatts. So I mean, it's it's just a, it's a standard country. It's a country standard now. So it was your first number one. Yeah, it was the first number one. That's wild. Yeah, and it was like the first week. Where he, it was the first day my my rest of my family was here. How cool. Yeah, it really was. It was crazy. Man. So, I mean, did somebody offer you a songwriting deal, like a publisher, record company? Um, I was. I was uh, writing for a no. This I guess I guess by that time I was writing for BMG, which is uh, Bertelsmann Music Group, mm -hmm. and that was another little bit of kismet. But um, I got a deal with 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 BMG without actually having much in the way of anything to offer that they could look at or hear because I I'd only had a couple of cuts that didn't get played in the radio, but a, a very uh, astute, intelligent man from. Uh, Europe, a great guy. He just uh, heard my stuff and said, you know, let's sign this guy. So that started things rolling. Now, uh, next to you, next to me was a weird, was a, like, it, was, it was a situation where we got a song cut without even, like, usually is a lot of pitching and all this stuff. We wrote the song, we did a little work tape of it, and four days later they cut it. So when you say we, who's we? Uh, my friend Curtis Wright. So Curtis, you and Curtis write this song. What's what's the demo sound like? Are you like just playing in front of a couple of mics with guitar and vocals? Uh, no, well, it, it? at the time there was a eight little. We, they had like studios in a box kind of thing. Oh yeah, the little eight yeah, tracks. And uh, and we worked up. And 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 Curtis is still one of the best singers in country music. Uh, Marty Rayburn probably, you know, certainly one of the best as well. But um, Curtis sings. Curtis is amazing. He's a bluegrass singer now, but uh, uh, he he did this. He did the vocal. I had gone back to Boston, and then he just called me up and said, "Hey, guess what? You know, they cut the song." Well, I mean, uh, how, how did that work? I mean, you you write a song, you get the demo done. He sings it, and you wrote it, and you're playing some guitars, I guess, right? And, yeah. And, and then, like, where do you where do you take the song? You, where we, where well, do you pitch it? Like, you, know, you know what I mean? Well, first off, the funny thing is that that was the third song we wrote that day. Uh, when I came down from Boston, you wrote right, three songs in one day. Well, very often, I, very often we did because I would come down from Boston, and I, you know I didn't want to waste my time. I'd come down with tons of hooks and half written things, and Curtis and I had written two songs. I have no idea what those other two songs were, and we were watching the New York Giants play somebody I forget who, drinking beers, and then halftime came. And Curtis said, you have anything else you want to play for me? And I was like, yeah, I got this little thing here. And I'm like, riding down the road in my pickup truck. You better get ready because I'm picking you up. I, I sang him the first verse. And he was like, well, let's write that. And I was like, okay. So he said, uh, so second verse, he said, how about this? Barbecue chicken in aluminum foil, just enough money for my gas and oil. I was like, Wow, I was just like, look at that, I got goosebumps right now that's, looking at that. That's great. And, 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 and uh, we finished that song before halftime was over. Damn. <laughs> and then it went, it was the number one song. Oh, look. Yeah. Halftime's only 20 minutes, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Damn, that's amazing. So I still want to know, you finish this song, who do you take it to? I mean, who do you pitch it to? I mean, you know, that's the, that's the process that I've... Sure. I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you finish the song... What do you do then? Well, Curtis had a publisher called Will and David, and uh, they, uh, they, it was just the music row okay, way of doing gotcha. things. Made a little work tape. They knew the producer. They brought the tape. They had a stack of tapes to listen to. Um, I've, he I've heard the story, actually, from Mike McGuire, that's the drummer in Shenandoah, told me that they passed on that song. And then uh, he said, wait a minute. Why don't we listen to it one more time? The second time they listened to it all the way through, they went, because he said, you know, we, we passed on it because back then country songs used to have like some sort of a little twist. Like I think on that same album was a brilliant, brilliant song called Ghost in This House, which is about an old girlfriend or ex-wife or whatever. I mean, it, there was always that little, nice yeah. little lyrical twist. 
Next to you, next to me was more of a percussive little, next to you, right next to me. I, I don't know why it came to my head. Well, I know why it came to my head because when I was running down this dirt road in New Hampshire the summer before, I saw this girl squeezed up next to this guy in a pickup truck, went right by me, kicking up dust. And I was like, hmm, I wish they had never gotten rid of those bench seats. I love those bench seats. But um, I, I started singing the song. And by the time I got back to where I was running a six mile loop, by the time I got back, I'd had, I had the form of the song. Right. I, I still have the breathless singing it into the tape recorder recording of it. And that uh, the same one that I ended up playing for Curtis. While so we're the watching second football. time Santa hears the tune, they're like, oh, you know. Well, they listen to it once and they're like, well, what's the, what's the twist? There was no twist to it. It's just, I like riding next to you, next to me. And well, listen to it. It's, it's cool. So I listen to it a second time. I, All right, we'll cut that one. Now, once you get a song cut, then you can only, you have no control as a writer. You can, you, you can only hope that it gets on the album. Right, because they always overcut. Yeah, right. The, the, and then the, the, once yeah. it gets cut on the album, then you can only hope that it's a single. I mean, and hope against hope because you get like a one out of 11 or 12 chance. And then once it's a single, you can only hope that the record label pours money into that song to push it up the chart because that's a very big part of it in the promotion. Uh, paying Not paying off people, but paying people to um, convince people. Every there does there can't be one weak link in the chain of events. Absolutely, and once you get that song to the top five, all bets are off. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you, you no one can guarantee you a number one. Although somebody did guarantee me a number one, the second number one I had, um, which was called uh, "What's It to You," and I did not want the artist to record it, and the artist did not want to record it, but the producer. Didn't tell me he was going to record it, and the artist was forced to record it by the producer. And <laughs> are you going to tell us who the artist? It, it was the... Clay Walker. Oh, okay. And he he was more of a traditionalist, more of a George Strait. And this was a pretty poppy song. Again, I wrote it with Curtis Wright, and he he just didn't want to record something with that little pop edge to it because he was a traditionalist. Well, who made the guarantee it was going to be number one? Well, I'm, I'll get to that. Okay. So, All right. so Clay, so Clay doesn't want to cut it, and. And, then, and, and and I don't want him to have it because I think this is a great song. I want this to go to someone who's a little further along. This is going to be this kid's first record. Anyway, one day I'm washing dishes and I in the kitchen and I hear coming from, you know, CMT or TNN or whatever it was back then that played the country music videos. I heard the opening chords of my song and I was like, someone stole my song. And I ran up and I see this video of this Clay Walker singing the song. That's how you found out? Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, they put the video up ahead of the release of the single. Then I get invited to this single release party where they have all these, uh, back in the day, you could hire the, what they called uh, independent promotion. Independent Yeah, promoters. until uh, the, the, the uh, attorney general of uh, New right. York... Uh, Brought them all down. Brought them all down. With but the back, mafia. But that, then you could, you could hire these guys. So I go to this party and... All these guys are coming up and shaking my hand and saying, congratulations on your number one. This is the day it was released. Congratulations, you're number one. Congratulations. I'm like, what do you mean congratulations on your number one? It just got released. It's number 39. <laughs> they, so, uh, well, I mean, uh, they put their money where their collective mods were for sure. And they, uh, th that next thing you know, it was my next number one. Those are the good old days when like, you yeah. know, when, a, when the record companies were run by old white guys, <laughs> the radio promotion was run by the mafia. Everything kind of worked kind of nice. Everybody was making money. Everybody was happy. Everything and then the whole thing fine. went to hell. It was all good. <laughs> Now what's the Spotify and the Rhapsody and the Pandora? <laughs> what's up with all that yeah. stuff? Bring me back to Mafia. And no, but you know what? The music business evolved in it. I won't say organic because it has so much to do with technology, but, you know, in a, in a natural way that goes along with technology. And, uh, and the, you can't, I'm still in it. 35 years later, most of the people that are my age have, you know, bailed a long time ago. You but know, I can't I live know, without this, it. This, it's, this town is still, you know what I mean, populated by, you know, you guys, our guys. You but know, there's only, I got to tell you, there's only, only about about not, about 20%, they say, over the there's 20% of so, real 
working songwriters that, than, than there were 10 years ago. Yeah. I got to ask you about Taylor Swift because everybody wants to know. And the thing that really pissed me off about that whole thing was when we were talking on the phone, it was a long time ago, and I remember re reading this article in the New Yorker about Taylor Swift. It was her profile, and it was long, it was lengthy, it was extensive, right? And I'm like, they didn't mention your name, but fucking once. Like, it was like a, a <laughs> sentence, right? Right. And I called you up, I'm like, like, Robert, like... You know, you, you. I mean, you didn't discover her, but you did give her the platform. Well, I don't like the word discover I, I, I because no one discovered Taylor Swift discovered herself. Yes, she did. Okay, and at the age of twelve years old, she was singing the national anthem at Madison Square Garden. And when I met her, she was thirteen, and she was way ahead of any other thirteen I'd ever met in terms of her savvy or business savvy, her confidence, uh, and and her songwriting ability. Now, back then, could she write a hit song? by herself yes but one out of ten i mean i've got all those recordings that she made when she was 11 and 12 and you know one out of ten is a, is a certified great song and there's a lot of uh, but after you know a couple of years of writing songs with other people and soaking it up like a sponge she didn't need anyone else after that i mean she was writing songs amazing songs by herself now i gotta say this uh that was a great experience for me but she's, I mean, how, yeah. did, how did you hook up with her? I mean, what, well, what it, this is an interesting story because she's the same age as my daughter. And my daughter was, I was working on a project with my daughter and one of her friends called Art Circus. And I was writing songs for them and they were singing them. And my friend Angelo had a writing date with this new girl on RCA Records. Angelo Petrano? Yes, yep. Angelo of uh, uh, the producer of uh, Kings, Kings of Leon. Leon, many many of their records, and he called me up and said, "You got to, you got to get over here. I get this this thirteen year old coming over. I don't know what to do. I mean, you you got a thirteen year old daughter. You, you know, I was like, Angelo, I have a writing appointment already today, and he says, No, no, no. You got to cancel it and come over here. And I was like, Well, he says she's on RCA, and I was like, Okay, done. I'm on, I'm on my way. <laughs> I'm in the car. <laughs> I'm in the car. So uh, we headed over there, and we we wrote. Gosh, we wrote two songs that first day. It was a ball. You and Taylor and Angelo? And Angelo, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, the funny thing is that people, when I tell that story, they go, RCA? She's not on RCA. And I'm like, she was. She was on RCA for a whole year. And at the end of that year, apparently RCA said they hadn't quite made up their mind about her and wanted another 60 days. And she and her parents had the balls to say what are you going to learn in 60 days that you haven't learned in the last year and they walked from an actual record deal and that's what opened her up to be able to go someplace else so i still have one of the packages that we would deliver we delivered these really cool packages i've got one in my office that we delivered around to all the labels in town and we tried to get them all to come down to a show that I set up at the Bluebird Cafe. Right, you told me about that. And it was uh, it was it was it was me and uh, Michael Peterson was an artist on Warner Brothers at the time, uh, brilliant young writer named Aaron Brotherton, and there was Taylor Swift. And every time it came around, I mean, this is like some heavyweight songwriters, and then you know, come around this. Now she's 14, 14 year old girl, just you know, knock people's socks off. She could be pitchy sometimes. Uh, but she, but she was astonishing at the same time, and that was the night that Scott Pachetta was there, the famous, uh, the, you know, he's the, probably the most powerful man in the in, in the music business now, right. incredible, uh, uh, probably the the best uh, record promoter in in Nashville for sure, and uh, you know that was the night she, she said, let's so do this. So you set up the showcase at the Bo Bluebird, and then she just comes out and sings, or was, it, was she, she played the guitar and she sang? The guitar yeah, and sang, yeah. and that was it. Were oh you, yeah, were I you mean she she had no problem grabbing a guitar and sitting down and playing. And and she she could play you 20 songs in a row. Yeah, so and and then so, so she gets a record deal through Scott Prochetta signs her. Well, he st he started a new label around her. He started Big Machine Records and she was the first artist. And I remember the day they announced the label, it was going to be a joint venture with um Oh, I won't get into that whole thing, but it was going to be a joint venture with another a, a country artist, and the, and they started two labels together. Right. And I remember they had the big, big big press thing at the Planet Hollywood, and I went in with Taylor and her her, her, her Scott and Andrea, her parents, and they announced you know this new label, and this is this girl's going to be our first a artist. How many songs did you have on the first record? There's uh, I mean, you well, you I, 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 right? I wrote three. 
I co-wrote three and I co I I I, I, I co co-wrote three and I co-produced three. Um, but they're not the same three. So there's four altogether. In other words, I I produced a song that she wrote by herself, but uh someone else produced one of the songs that I wrote, and then uh Angelo and I co-wrote and co-produced two songs. So it, it, listen, that thing's that thing's at about 10 million now. It's still paying the bills, and she is the gift that keeps on giving. And, the, and, and I'll tell you this: she, there's there's a, uh, and I, I mean that because of new movie syncs and different ways to use these songs. And uh, I remember walking into a CVS and seeing a Valentine's Day display of cards by one of the card companies, and there was a song I wrote called "I'm Only Me When I'm With You." I know that song. It's yeah, beautiful. And, and I opened up the card. And it had sparkles on it and stuff. And I opened it up and there was my recording, Angelo and my recording of I'm Only Me When I'm With You in the card. And there's the cre songwriting credit on the back. And the card paid better than CDs or you know, <laughs> pay. They were paying 18 cents a card. People don't know that a song on a CD only makes you 9.1 cents if you wrote it by yourself. But they're paying 18 cents a card. To th I mean, I forgive the fact that I'm only me when I'm with you is 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 not a great Valentine's Day idea because it's actually the you know sort of the codependency it's kind of the opposite of what you want in a relationship but that's okay it had sparkles on it <laughs> you know what I mean so what oh, so what ha what happened after that did you do anything on the second album third album well the se the second record most people don't know the second record it's called Beautiful Eyes and it was an a limited edition. EP, Walmart only, and it had an EP and a, a six-song EP with a uh, DVD with all kinds of videos and special stuff. And uh, I co-produced three of the songs uh, on that, and, and uh, Nathan Chapman uh, produced the other ones and did a great job. That first record, by the way, when, that, when, that, when the second record came out, Beautiful Eyes, it did something that you don't see very often, maybe once in a, a decade, but she had the number one and the number two album on the country charts. Wow. Yeah. And so album number three comes out and she's just off and running? Or what? Yeah, I mean, yeah. she, listen, artists evolved, they yeah. move on. She was really comfortable yeah. uh, doing what she was doing. I think the next record, he produced the whole thing. And, it, and then the next record is when she started like using some maybe multiple producers. Right. And of course, the rest is history. Right. Yeah. So, um, why did you start a record company? That just seemed like so crazy. Well, I started Infinity Cat. 2002, right? 2002 with Jake and Jamin because they asked your, me to. Your two sons. My Jake two sons. They, Jake and Jamin said, hey, Dad, they had a band called The Sex. They were 12. The Sex? Yeah, they S were, S -E -X? yeah, they were 12 and 14 and 16, the three of them. And, <laughs> and, and I, said, I said, I remember my wife said to me, I don't, I'm not sure about the name of this band. I mean, they're just kids. And I said, but, but they've already made the pins and the, and the, and the patches. The t-shirt, the merch They've already is done. got the merch, right. And I said, besides, Jake has assured me that it has nothing to do with sex. It has to do with the sex, like the sex of a plant or the sex of a, uh, of, of, a of a snake of or a chicken whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, of course, I knew that he was smarter than I was and he just knew that sex sells and um, that was the start of Infinity Cat yeah and how did I mean it's a drummer and a three string guitar player he played like a regular guitar but only with the three bottom yeah, strings yeah well Jake right? Jake Jake figured it would be easier to learn how to play with half the strings <laughs> that's the reason he played a three string guitar and then they just wanted to keep it minimal I mean Jamin for some reason always had three drums and three cymbals but that led us to um I mean, that was the sex was the first record, and the new record, Daddy Daddy Issues, which is blowing up. So this is the first week of its release, and it's going to chart on a couple of the Billboard charts. It is our release number one hundred and twenty. So you start this label, Jeff the Brotherhood is the well, the sex involved Jeff in the, the Brotherhood, Jeff the Brotherhood, be your own pet, and then and then. You had a band from Baltimore on there too, right? For a couple of years oh, ago. Oh, Ed, Ed Schrader's Music Beat. Right. Fantastic band. Love so Ed. How, how, are, how are you? So it's a, it's like kind of like a what? A pop? What would you call it? Just a pop punk? Label? Yeah, post punk pop. Post -punk uh, pop. I mean, this this record here, fans of Nirvana have uh, who are girls, uh, and there's a lot of girls who are fans of Nirvana who are in their teens. They are they are loving Daddy Issues. Daddy Issues. So. 
like a band comes to you, their name Diarrhea Planet. Are you are you like going, hey fellas, you know the name? I did ask them. I I, I said, listen, I, I love these songs. I hadn't seen them live, but I I said you can't put a record out called Diarrhea Planet. I hate this word. That was my most hated word in the English language. Worse than any other word you can think of. I just it made me sick. And then I went and saw him play live, and I just—I saw him at the exit in. Yeah, they were just and, amazing. Like, they were really good. I mean, they yeah. had all those harmonies going. Four lead guitar players. I know, and, and guys singing their asses off. Yeah, yeah they're incredible. It was and they've really done good. very, very well. Their most recent record is "Turn to Gold," which turned to gold. And uh, yeah, we we uh, it was gold when it came out. We pressed them in gold vinyl. And you encourage these guys and gals and bands to. Just get in a van and hit the road. Yeah, well, if you're not gonna if you're not gonna go out and do 200 dates a year, forget about it. So is that is that like a prerequisite for Here's you? Here's the prerequisite. Them? Number one, great original, amazing band. There's a lot of them though. Number two, um, friend of a friend kind of thing. We've never signed anybody because they sent a tape or something. It has to be like, oh, hey, we went on the road with this Ed Schrader's music beat, and they're so much fun. They're really cool. That brings me to number three have to be really awesome people, great people. Yeah. You know, I don't want to work with knuckleheads. Okay. So then after all that, then it's like, we want to keep this record label small. So we're only doing four major, like, like deep dream from daddy issues four major, uh, releases. releases a year. This year it'll be that. We have a Colleen Green record coming. We had a new music band record probably before the end of the year. But and probably some Jeff the Brotherhood stuff. But um, uh, sort sort of off stuff. They do these like weird little tapes where's and the, stuff. Where's the name come from? Infinity Cat. That's it, it the came, coolest, if that's you, the coolest logo in the world. Well, if you look at the logo, it's funny. Is it, it comes from the logo, and it's the first yeah, time we've I mean, ever. But, but who? Yeah, the, the, the Jake, like- Jake drew this little doodle called an infinity cat, and he drew it all the time in different. We'd have infinity cat. That's a cat with an infinity symbol right. over its head. I don't know why, oh. but it was um, it was on a skateboard or it was driving a car or whatever it was. But it right. was an infinity cat, and I just loved it. And, and so it was his creation. It was his creation oh, okay. as a, a as little, a visual a little, artist. A little cart, little cartoon. Yeah, and he creation. drew it all the time. And right. And uh, one of his teachers in high school said that he was going to make a million bucks with that. Yeah, because uh, with the logo alone, because you know it was just so cute. It was, and, it is, uh, it is, and uh, so we picked one, and that's the one that's been the logo ever since. All right, let's wrap it up. Um, so you're going to get a haircut, <laughs> then you're going to go to Boston yeah. for a wedding, yeah, and then you're going to like Norway and Lithuania, uh, Lithuania, yeah, and then back to uh, <laughs> the Boston, New Hampshire, Maine, Cape Cod. Um, and then we'll be back in August. So who runs the label while you're gone? The oh kid, my the gosh, kids? Ollie Delgado, and that's it's, it's pronounced like the skateboard move, Ollie, mm-hmm. but it's 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 short for Alejandro, so it's A L E, Ollie uh, Delgado. She she runs the label. She is How our. Is she? She's about uh, 26, 27. I I'm, I'm, I I smile because I always kid. She's that amazing. She, she looks like she's about twenty years old. But yeah, she does. She was an intern for us and she was uh, an employee for us. Then she was an intern and employee. And when she graduated from Belmont, four days later, later she got a job with CAA, which is Creative like, Artist Agency, yeah. one of the biggest agencies in the world. Yes, they are. And I was like, that's, you know, that's, the, congratulations, that's a career. And about two months later, she called me and said, I'm quitting. I want to come back to Infinity Cat. And she's been here ever since. How and cool. she is a miracle. She really is a miracle. She's a wonderful gal. Yep. All right, that's it. Well, thanks for taking the time. I know you're a busy, man. Hey, what about the game tonight? You're going to watch. Are you kidding me? Nashville tonight, we'll, Predators. We'll, tu- we'll turn it Pittsburgh around. Pittsburgh Penguins. Gonna, we're going to turn it around. You All must right. be in a tough place. You got Pittsburgh. You, you know, you love Pittsburgh. You know, and you love I'm, Nashville. I'm, no, I'm not in a tough place because I come from Baltimore, and our big rival has always been the Pittsburgh Steelers and sure. our, foot, our football right. team. You know, like they come, we go there. There's fights. They come here. The, yeah. the Baltimore, there's fights. So I'm not. You know, I. I I love Pittsburgh as a town, and I, I love a good rivalry. I don't hate Pittsburgh Steelers or their fans or anything, but I like a good rivalry. Yeah. But, I, you know, Nashville, Baltimore doesn't have a hockey team. So when I moved to Nashville like six, seven years ago, my friend had uh, season tickets, so I'd go to a lot of the games. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, go Predators. Well, how does a, uh, this, this is, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how this series is going to is gonna end up, and I don't know when this is going to air, and it might, might sound like a fool, but I don't see how it could be that, it, that, a, that a penguin 
defeats a predator. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? I know. It's like not. It's, it as makes a, more as, sense as, for a as predator a, to eat a penguin. Yeah. What's a Bruin? Uh, well, it's a. What's a Bruin? It, Bruin is a bear. <laughs> Is a what? What's a Bruin, baby? <laughs> what's a Bruin? <laughs> what's a Bruin in that pot over hey, there? What's Nelly? a Bruin? Hey, what's happening? <laughs> hey, no, it's a Bruin is a bear. Oh, it yeah, is? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right thanks, Robert. All right, you hockey puck. <laughs> All right, you hockey puckers. So there you go. That was my conversation with Robert Ellis Arl, R E O, in Nashville, Tennessee. Can't wait to get back to Nashville. Nashville is such a great town. It's got such a certain electricity, and there's a lot of stuff going on there. When I first got to Nashville, um, one of the first guys I looked up was a guy named Mark O'Toole. Mark was from Baltimore, moved to Nashville a few years before I did. Mark took me around and introduced me to a lot of music biz folks, publishers and producers and musicians. He was really quite gracious. Mark used to manage a band called the Baja Men who had a big hit with Who Let the Dogs Out? Remember that song? Mark told the story about how that song came to be. After the Baja Men finished the first CD, Mark and the execs from Sony took the Baja Men out to Yankee Stadium for a baseball game before they flew back to the Bahamas the next day. A song came over the sound system and the Baja Men started singing along. It was an old Caribbean classic, and the execs at Sony insisted that they record the song the next day. Well, the Baja men had been in New York for a couple of weeks and didn't want to postpone their trip home. So they protested, but the next day, they went into the studio and recorded Who Let the Dogs Out, and uh, the rest is history. Mark told me the revenue from that song was millions and millions of dollars, not only from the sales and the airplay, but, you know, figure T-shirts, commercials, stadium, airplay. It was a huge moneymaker. Well, when I was in Nashville, I wrote a song that needed a girl singer. And the first guy I called was Mark. I wanted to see if he knew of anybody. He insisted, really insisted strongly, that I call a gal named Julianne Irwin. So I did. Turns out Julianne is from Baltimore, my hometown, Mark's hometown. And we went into the studio, and wow, what a voice. Kid can sing. I loved what she did with this song. So here it is, a Slim Man tune called Closer to You. Thank you, Mark. The rainy night we fell in love. The second day. I'm thinking of love, baby. 
dream a little dream of the two of us.